What's happening, captains? This is the Friendly Leaps Podcast, and we are sailing into a week filled with video game news that we need to recap. I'm Jack Peglow, and with me is my best friend, Rob Wong. And Rob, I know you have uh, something special for us, so why don't you why don't you hit us with it? Well, I mean, I love the transition because we're talk we're going to talk about a game that has a lot of boats and stuff. In it. Hell yeah! You use captains. Love, love that, love that. But uh, yeah, it's Monday. It's it's here in the we Bay Area. It. Yeah, Monday it, night we did it in the Bay Area. It's been a little little cold over the last couple days, and by cold I mean like low sixties. Bro, um, it dropped from like seventy degrees to like fifty degrees over the course of an hour in Chicago yesterday. It's ridiculous what the weather is doing. And then the forecast today said that it's supposed to heat up in the like the low 70s uh apparently like there's a Thursday. there's a term for this when this happens when there's that significant of a drop it's called a pneumonia front is that really what they call it yes <laughs> that's not a that's not a good phrasing for especially the current times right not great at all but since since the times aren't that great it's a monday the weather's all weird and everything i have myself my final white claw that's been in my fridge for about four weeks now marinating marinating just in the back of the back of the fridge uh black cherry flavor this is actually my first time jack you've said that this is the best flavor in your black cherry's fire um so yeah here we go cracking it open and you're gonna hear it oh Oh. baby oh beautiful and cheers to you my friend this is monday cheers to you I, i told you before i got a i got some baileys and my coffee sitting here in my my warp pipe mug so cheers okay this is not that bad I told you, dude. Yeah. Initially, it kind of tasted like Robitussin. Sure. Sure. But definitely. But, I think anything with cherry, you're going to get a little bit of that, like, medicine. Yeah. But it kind of tastes... What is it? What does this kind of taste like? The back end kind of tastes um, like a Starburst, like a cherry Starburst. See, I feel like it, it reminds me sort of like of a, like a vodka Red Bull kind of taste. But it like does. much more palatable. Yes, yes, not as strong. There's not. I mean, there's definitely not vodka in this thing. So, um, yes, this this is great. This is definitely going on my list of purchases I need to make. The claw. <laughs> the claw. But uh, but like we said, we got a lot to cover this week. So we gotta we gotta get to it, my dude. We do. We do. Take us out, Captain. We'll start with uh, the weekly rundown. Uh, like like we've been saying, names will organically evolve over time. But so far, it's just a quick hit of uh, some of the the big news items in video gaming this week. And and one of the biggest, if not the biggest, little snippet is that the international is no more this year. I mean, it makes sense for for the uh, unaware. The international is the Dota 2 championships. Um, the usually the biggest prize pool in esports every year because it's funded by people buying the battle pass for the game. Uh, I think it is usually over like it's it's multiple millions of dollars in the prize pool, regardless yeah. of whatever the actual number is. But this is a big deal. And it's it's especially a big deal because this is the tenth anniversary of the international, I believe. That sucks. That yeah. really sucks. Big time. And uh, and it's not the only competition that's been canceled. Evo twenty twenty has also officially been canceled. Ugh. The biggest fighting game tournament of the year is no more. Yeah, I. I mean- 
I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm wrecked. I'm a wreck. I know you are. You're you personally, you're personally like emotionally invested in Evo. Yes, dude. Evo is the <laughs> shit. It doesn't get like it's so hype, like because it's every big fighting game. Uh, this year was going to be really cool too because there is a Marvel versus Capcom two Invitational they were going to put on. Oh no way! They had like all uh... of the big names: Justin Wong, uh, Tokido. I think was going to be there. Daigo, they were all coming in. That's such a classic game, too. Oh, yeah, man. Like so many things in popular culture come from that game that I think people don't even realize. Yeah, but they will be hosting some online versions of the Evo Championships, which will be both funny because, like we've talked about in a previous episode. Fighting games online are such a different thing than fighting games offline. Yep. For example, Smash is the one that's I'm always going to bring up when it comes to this stuff. Uh, the best player in the world, MK Leo, who is like hands down the best Smash Ultimate Fighter in the world. Like it's not close. He he's getting like he just got a top eight in a tournament for the first time in like weeks. How many? Because it's such a different game. How many controllers do you think he's like thrown at the wall <laughs> just because of like his frustrations with lag and, and input lag? Well, see, Smash players got to be careful with that because every they most of them use GameCube controllers, which are harder to come by nowadays. That's true. That is true. A lot of, and a lot of them have custom made ones too. Yeah, yeah, but I, I'm I'm just assuming a guy of MK Leo's caliber and stature probably not hard to come by another one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you can get it made. I actually have a custom one that I've done a little work on. Uh, it's got some cool stuff. Like, one of the things that a lot of people do is, I don't know if you are familiar with the GameCube controller, but the L and the R button are sort of on a spring. Yeah. And it was cool and it was really innovative back in the day because it was the first controller to have, like, pressure sensor triggers because you could half press the GameCube controller trigger and it would do different things in the full press. Yeah, because I remember you can, you can you, if you had the the one, the see-through one, you could like pull it down all the way to where the spring is about to hit the bottom. And then when you push it down further, it like does that little click motion, like a right. mechanical keyboard. Right. It's a great feeling on your hands. Uh, which for some games, like in Melee, there is actual use for that. But in Ultimate, there's no benefit to having two different trigger presses. So what a lot of people do, and what I did, is you remove the spring entirely and you make it a mechanical button. Uh, I did not know that. Yeah, that is a, that is a pro, hashtag pro tip. That is a pro tip. Pro pro tip. Spend money on a custom controller <laughs> <laughs> if you want to get good at Smash. Might as well like, invest. In yeah, it. it's funny, and a lot of people when they first get into Smash, we are on such a tangent. I'll finish quickly. Uh, a lot of people when they when they first get into custom or not custom competitive Smash. They think like, okay, like what's the what's the pro controller setup? Like everybody uses GameCube controllers. And the answer is there is no optimal controller setup. There's no optimal button layout. It's whatever you feel comfortable with. All of the pros all use different button configurations. There's even pros specifically, like the example that a lot of people use is a pro named DeBuzz, who uses different controller button configurations when he fights with different characters. Which makes perfect sense. It does, especially when you consider what he's doing. But regardless, there is no one optimal setup. There's not even one optimal controller. One of the, a couple of the best players use Pro Controllers. Some of the rest use GameCube controllers because that's what they're used to. I mean, yeah. this is the first Smash game where Pro Controllers were a thing. Right, right. So there is nothing. Use what works best for you. Some There are people that like get top eights at locals with Joy-Cons. Which is perfectly fine. Yeah. No shame. If that's what here. works, that's what works. Yeah. If that's what gets you to wins, who cares? See that this is like one of my favorite things about fighting games, because this is the case overall. Like there's even there's Smash Pros that use hitboxes too. Um, <laughs> and, and a lot of them do it because their their wrists are starting to break down because they've been playing video games for too long. But I digress. That's one of the things I love about fighting games is that like there is no set thing that you need to do. Like, it's just, if it works, it works. Yeah. That actually, I mean, it makes perfect sense now. I mean, I'm just, 
I just grew up in the era of like playing Tekken and stuff at the arcade. So like, if right. I'm playing any of those fighting games, like I need the little joystick with like the you know the six six or eight button. And that's what a lot of people use. Like that's what if you watch like Dragon Ball Fighters or if you watch like Grand Blue Versus, a lot of them are using those. Yeah, because you can buy ones that you can like have in your lap. Right. Yeah. The small. But versions. like one of the best players in uh, fighting games, Sonic Fox, he'll use that in like tournaments, but he uses a controller a lot. He uses a PlayStation 4 controller. To each his own, man. To each his own. When it comes to, like, actually competing, he uses a hitbox, but he's not afraid to jump in with a PS4 controller with a DualShock. I mean, if it if it works, man. I mean, but, I mean, my hands just don't work like that anymore. Yeah. And plus, with on a PlayStation controller, I don't think my, hand, my fingers could move that quickly. Anyway... Eva will be hosting some online events, so that'll be interesting, to say the least. Yeah. I mean, just to wrap it up, basically, for me as a Korean-American, like, Dota 2 inter- internet or the international being canceled is like a gut punch to, like, you know, just Koreans around the world, like, being able to plant their flag as, like, the, the best gaming nation in the world. And then Evo is just, for you, it's just like, this is where the best of the best of Smash players come to play and along with some there's of those just, other There's so games. many cool things that happened in Evo. Like last year, one of the coolest storylines was this kid that came out of nowhere from uh, Iran, I believe, to win Tekken. Just just appeared. Just like debuted a known at name. Evo. People knew about him, but like relatively he was a known name. Right, right. He wasn't like he wasn't like a dark horse candidate to win it, nor was he like a favorite. He was just a dude right. that was participating, and they some right. people knew him. Okay, yeah, see, man, esports, sports, everyone loves a good underdog story. Yeah, man, it sucks. It does. It really does. Speaking of sucks, uh, the internet decided to get real mad about Doom this week. Mm. That wasn't even this week. Was that today or yesterday? Like, it was yeah, it was recent. I think just yeah. today the director of the game said something about it. Yeah. You wanna quickly run through it? So executive producer, he said that. He said this today. Um I'm just gonna read from uh from this post on VG twenty four seven. Uh, following numerous complaints from fans over the quality of the audio and claims from its composer that the soundtrack was mixed without him, executive producer Marty Stratton describes the events that transpired behind the scenes prior to the release of Doom Eternal's OST. Over the past couple of weeks, I've seen a lot of discussions centered around the release of Doom Eternal original game soundtrack. The lengthy post begins... While many fans like the OST, there is speculation and criticism around the fact that the game's talented and popular composer, Mick Gordon, excuse me, edited and mixed only 12 of the 59 tracks on the OST, the remainder being edited by our lead audio designer here at ID. Some have suggested that we've been careless with or disrespectful of the game music. Others have speculated that Mick wasn't given the time or creative freedom to deliver something different or better. The fact is, none of that is true. Uh, according to Stratton, Gordon was not under contract to work on the game's OST at the time of its announcement at E3, and because of ongoing issues receiving the music we needed for the game, did not want to add to the distraction at the time. The composer was only brought in to the fold in January, with both parties reaching a general agreement to deliver 12 tracks by early March. So, uh, it sounds like people were real upset because they didn't think the OST lived up to their expectations, and the composer was salty and was publicly salty about it, which is never a good thing. And uh, it sort of spiraled out of control. This is one of those weird situations where, like, video game community was actually kind of maybe somewhat in the right here. Because, I mean, let's, to be totally frank, it, it they basically said we didn't want to talk about it because we felt it was going to be a distraction, which means that they understood that this could be a complaint um, from right. the community if they were to talk about it. And, you know, 12 out of the 59 tracks, it's only 20% of the entire music was actually done by the popular and talented guy named Mick Gordon. So if you're a fan of the game and you are, like, you know, just diving, like, headfirst into all of this and are in the know of all of this, like, yeah, that's super upsetting. 
that's that's like us like finding out like later about let's say like smash and like sakurai only had investment into like 20 percent of the characters <laughs> you know right. like like that's like yeah yeah you probably want to say that in advance otherwise the expectation is that sakurai is going to be working on the entirety of the game like you right. can't yeah you can't sidestep it um i'm glad they brought it up and i'm glad and i'm actually glad also from doom's perspective that they actually you know didn't just like sidestep it they like actually confronted it and told told you what happened and when they brought him in and how many tracks he actually did so yeah i think i think the story is pretty much done at this point i mean what what more can you I do i mean really? yeah it, to me this whole story strikes me as like we're really mad we're big mad over a little thing right right it's something that you should have told us in advance then we wouldn't be this mad right which is perfectly perfectly understandable but i mean that is not only just the internet as a whole, but that is video games online. Big mad over something little. Yep. Yep. I totally agree. Uh, so let's move on to something positive. Rob, hit me with what you've been playing this week. What have I been playing this week? Um, Animal Crossing, of course. Uh, I jumped back into FIFA 20 because I just wanted to get a sports game just to, just to cleanse the palate of my gaming and just to dip in and play, you know, like a career mode and get the players I want on my favorite team and, and such. Uh, and then you're doing a mission of Red Dead Redemption 2 here and there just to finish out the game. And then, of course, the big one. I got an email this morning that I got my Valorant key. Oh, my God. We did it. We did it. Oh, six days. Six days of watching streams. Um, not 24-7, but six days of watching streams, and I got it. And I played two games today. They're fun. They're fast-paced. They're easy to play. The tutorial's not that great. It doesn't really tell you what, how uh, the abilities work and what you're buying and what weapons have what traits and whatnot. Got to get good. But it's just something that I'm just going to have to get used to as I play. So Get good. Yeah. I did play with Nam today. Uh, shout, out to, shout out to our buddy Nam. And, uh, yeah, it was fun. We lost both games we played. But then at, right after we had finished, he played a game and he won. So he rubbed that in my face. Yeah, you were the issue. I guess I was the issue. I mean, but to be fair, in our la in the second game we played, we both ranked at the, bot entire, the bottom of the game. Like, we were the worst two players in the entire game. So well, it's not really my fault. Um, just the other guys carried us. But so it goes. Yeah. What about you, Jack? What are you playing? This, what have you been playing this last week? Well, speaking of, uh, of first person shooters, I actually jumped a little bit back into Destiny 2 because they are running the Guardian Games, uh, which, if you don't know, is a competition that they're finally putting on where the classes can stand up and say, I'm the best. And uh, unfortunately for us warlocks. <laughs> We are we're in we're in last place, but we always knew that we were the least populous class because it takes a special kind of player to be a warlock. I mean, not everyone can have a brain this big, you know. I mean, not not everyone can wear like a, a full robe, right? Not everyone can live the floof life. Yeah, not everyone. But uh, but titans titans are winning. They're winning big, and hunters are salty about it. Yeah, it's too many titans in this world, man. We need to, we need to, uh, what's it, dwindle their population a little bit. It's maybe some Darwinism needs to take effect. Well, too bad Guardians literally can't die canonically. Yeah. Well, I mean, they can. They can. A couple have, but yeah. like. Technically, you shouldn't be able to. It's real hard. <laughs> R.I.P. Cade. Shout out to the homie. Uh, also playing Animal Crossing. Mayday was dope. Did you uh, did you play it all during the the May Day event? I did a little bit. I dipped into it a little bit. Uh, did you get your your ticket and do the little maze? I did not. I did get my ticket. I just did not do. Well, the you maze. have until the seventh. So okay. So I do have time to dip back into it. But yeah, I, I liked it. I the maze is fun. You'll enjoy it. I'm excited. And there's a special. So you you being this being your first Animal Crossing, uh, it probably won't hit as good for you. But there's a special surprise uh guest at the end of the maze that's Ooh. been a character in all of the previous animal crossings Ooh. but i won't spoil it for you you'll all enjoy right. it all right um i'll hit persona 5 royal 
I've been playing. The only thing that I really have to bring up this week that's new is that I've been playing on Merciless, uh, which is the hardest difficulty, and it's sort of, at least in the early game, is really making me think a lot, and it's sort of scratching the little tactics game itch a little bit. Huh. Uh, which I've really enjoyed because I God, I love a good tactics game. Into the Breach, shout out. Incredible, maybe one of the best tactics games I've ever played. Uh, but uh, I've been I've been enjoying it quite a bit. So if you are looking for a challenge and you're familiar with the mechanics, play Merciless. Yeah, I mean maybe the second go around. But at least the first one, I want to enjoy the story, so I'll just probably just play on normal and just... Totally. And through. I've actually... I've had this conversation with a lot of people over a lot of different games, but I really, really appreciate a game that lets you play the way you want to play. So, like, I want that challenge. I want it to be punishing. So right. I can play on Merciless and have that experience. But if you don't want that, you don't have to do it, and then there's no punishment for not playing it that way and i really appreciate that yeah it's not like those old games where it's like you have to play on the super difficulty to like unlock the secret ending right like you know and it's it, that's different than like a Soulsborne game which is you know i mean from the drop that that game is going to beat the shit out of you and that's what it's sold as that's the game that you are getting and you know it coming in yeah um yeah i get i understand why people like that game or those games um they're just not for me <laughs> yeah and that's fine yeah, which I which I think we're totally in agreement about. Uh, finally, I've been I jumped back into Smash a little bit. I'm back on my Duck Hunt bullshit. <laughs> I feel like Duck Hunt Dog is like my soul main because he's like he's goofy and he, I can zone, I can be aggressive, and people get mad when a good Duck Hunt plays because it looks goofy, but it's actually really effective, and that's kind of my jam. I mean, for for me as someone who plays against you sometimes, and as, when you play Duck Hunt. It's just, I hate playing against guys who are good at duck hunt or Isabel. It's just, it's so annoying. <laughs> like, oh yeah, just Isabel's real most, annoying. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. But um, speaking of speaking of online events, I put this in late. Uh, Evo's been canceled, but there has been a couple uh, big events with big pots that have been online events, and they've sort of. I don't really like watching them because it's so different and it feels off, but there's going to be a big tournament. There's a 10K pot tournament that's being run that will be all random. Wow. So I'm really pumped to watch that. But is there is there seeding based on who is a part of it? Like if, if MK yeah. Leo decides... It's an invitational, so it's okay. not like random people got can it, enter got this. It, got it. Oh, wow. But yeah, there it, it'll be seeded too. That's going to be very interesting to watch. But it's going to be it's going to be pretty big because I know that like MK Leo is going to be there a lot of pros but like not only that but Zero will play and he he was like the god of Brawl and Smasher Wii U. He has one of the craziest streaks of wins. Like he he didn't drop a set for years. Yeah. For years. Which is insane. And he'll be playing, which is dope. Well, we don't know really know when, but if we get any updates, yeah, I mean it's at least something to look forward to, right? Not a lot of those these days, but uh, we do have a big thing to look forward to. Uh, I think technically it's already started, but uh, that's going to transition us right into round one. Round one, Woo. let's get to it. Which is the beautiful phoenix rising from the ashes of E three, and that is the <laughs> Summer Games Fest. Which is Jeff Keighley's new interactive online, all of the above celebration of gaming, both old and new, basically. This is like Keighley's way of like becoming the Shinra Corporation and, and just kind of taking over the world. Like he started off just having the game awards and like doing like the whole like I have winter in my hands and you cannot take like the winter months away from me. And then now with this, if this succeeds and judging by the list that we have right here and the list that you, I mean, I'm sure it'll grow. Yeah. Like that's my thing. It's like over. E3 was already dying. Yeah. Uh, and I said this when it was canceled. I mean, it, it, the bell was tolling. I mean, and if this goes well, 
I just don't know as a like as a publisher, like let's say I'm Blizzard. If this goes well and I see not even like the same level, like even if it's slightly, slightly less engagement with all of my new announcements that come out of this, for how much less this costs, I think it's a no-brainer that like you're doing something like this next year instead of E3 again. Oh yeah. I think the there's only positives in my mind that can come from this. Unless the unless the method and the platform in which they decide to do this, like not and we, we'll get into the details of what is actually happening, but um, like how they decide to go about getting the games out to players to demo, as long as that is streamlined well, there's no negative here for any company to not be a part of because one, you'll get actual feedback from a very large sample size. Oh, yeah. Versus E3, we are getting just from that you know, group of whoever is attending. And you'll get all those people that wanted to play these demos but just weren't able to pay the price to get into E3 or, you know, just did not live near and were able to travel to it. So, yeah. But that being said, let's get into, like, what it's about. So this is the the announcement straight from the Keeley's mouth. The Summer Game Fest is a four-month series of global events to highlight video games. The season will run from May to August 2020 and feature updates from the following game publishers and platforms. And then there's a big list. I can run through it real quick. You ready? Let's do it. 2K, Activision, Bandai Namco, Bethesda, Blizzard, Bungie, Bungie, CD Projekt Red, (laughs) Digital Extremes, Electronic Arts, EA, a.k.a. Microsoft, Xbox, Private Division, Riot Games, Sony Entertainment, Steam, Square Enix, and Warner Brothers. I mean, just to flip that on you, you're basically running through what? Every NBA, sports game. Every sports game, every like RTS, every like fighting Blizzard, game. Bethesda, every fighting game. Except, well, Nintendo's never been. I mean, Nintendo technically hasn't been at E3 for the past, what, three years? Yeah, they're going to do their own thing. So, Well, we'll get into that in a minute. Yeah, and then... Yeah, then you have most of the big, like multiplayer games like Riot and Steam. You have Destiny. Uh, you have yeah, Cyberpunk, and, and then you have the two big consoles that are do- that are going to be basically talking about all their first party games. So, yeah, <laughs> I mean, you have Riot. This covers all your bases. I mean, it's all there. But you kind of touched on this a second ago, and I wanted to swing back the 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 hitch that this has and the 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 jump they need to land is the demos yep and keely even talks about this so this is a quote from uh, an article in variety he says when you think about it the idea of consumers waiting in line to play a game at a booth is antiquated especially with digital distribution in these uncertain and challenging times it's more important than ever that video games serve as a common and virtual connection point between us all summer games fest is an organization is is an organizing principle that promises fans a whole season of video game news and other surprises from the comfort of home. So he even kind of touches on it. He doesn't get into a full, but waiting in line to play a demo at E3 was the reason to go to E3. Yep. That's why you went. Otherwise, you could just stay home and watch the trailers like all of us. The, the point of going was to get your hands on stuff. So for this to succeed... The demos that they've planned on rolling out alongside these announcements, they have to work. They have to be available and easy to get. And people have to like them. Because the thing about throwing all this stuff out to regular people is that a lot more can go wrong. Yep. I mean, not only that, like a lot, just from a security standpoint, like a lot more can be data mined. Yeah. A lot more can, can leak. Um, and the thing I'm, okay, so I'm not a hundred percent sure on this, but I, I remember reading something about this where when you go to play games at E3, unless it's like on an open, uh, floor, like a lot of the games that are like in rooms that you have to like wait to get into. And you have like, let's say an official from, you know, Bungie or EA, like standing next to the console that you're playing on, like explaining to you what's happening and so on. A lot of those games actually are run on the console's. But those consoles aren't commercial consoles. They're right. like they're like the debugged or like the debugged versions that are used for game development. Right. So it runs games differently, and you can set it up for them to run 
for that specific purpose. So the question is, like, and you, without, can, you, you know, can have one years. that you've built a vertical slice on, and you know it'll run on this stuff, fine. But you don't know right. if it's going to run on my MacBook Pro that I've hackintoshed at home. Yep. Yeah, and you don't know like how that's going to react to like you know a first gen PlayStation Four, right? Like or the original Xbox One X. Like you just you just don't know how what the conditions are you know for those devices. So yeah, there's that's that's actually what I meant by that's by the platform that they're going to be sending this out on. Um, and you know Sony, like Sony and Xbox, like they're going to have a Oh man, their servers like if these Bro. if these things oh my god. <laughs> Oof. Yeah. So I mean, that's the first point. Um but I wanted to get your thoughts on like what you, you know do you do you think like this is from, from your eyes like a successful like type of like business structure? I think it has potential for sure. I mean, I'm like I said if you look at this from the the point of view of a developer the way this is spread out means there's theoretically a lot less competition. You maybe have a day or even a week dedicated to all of your stuff where you don't have to worry about announcing your big game and then watching it get overshadowed by someone else's bigger game. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, there's, there's just, there's a lot of reasons for a developer to like it. Uh, but like we keep saying, I mean, there's also reasons to be worried. I mean, there's potentially both a lot less and a lot more work that needs to be done. I'm hoping it goes well. I will say this. Uh, I think E3 as a business model was uh, antiquated and needed to adapt and didn't. But I will still miss E3, the event. Mm -hmm. which is sort of bigger than what the actual just trade show was. It sort of evolved into almost like a holiday for video games. Yeah. And there was like the one week when everybody from every different genre. So you had the fighting game people, you had the RTS people, you had the FPS people, everybody was doing the same, watching the same thing. Yep. And just getting hyped. And I'm, uh, that I will miss. Yeah, I mean, E3 for me, I don't know for you, but for me, it was on my bucket list of things that I wanted to go to, like, just as a just as a person, like, conventions that I always wanted to attend as, like, just to, like, walk around and just see, like, totally. the sights was E3 and San Diego Comic-Con. I've probably have been soured because I've had to, for the past couple of years, I had to go to the PGA merchandise show, so trade shows have been sort of ruined for me. <laughs> because I've had to work them. <laughs> yeah. But, like, it's just like you see, like, all the, you know, the little giveaways that they do, like, the free stuff they give away at E3 is, like, to be a part of, like, that atmosphere, like, that that uh, auditorium when you, like, get, you know, like, a crazy announcement um, and just to see it in person in that, like, that feeling of how everyone that you're sitting with. It's kind of like when you went to go watch like Avengers Endgame, right? Like everyone is there to see that one thing on the screen. Right. No one is there to like just socialize or whatnot. Like everyone is fully invested into what is about to be shown. Right. Uh, and just like the the roar of cheers and like the hype and like, you you know, you see all those, like now at least you have it all streamed everywhere. So you see like the faces and like the jaws drop when like certain things are announced and just being a part of that and that atmosphere um like if if that doesn't come back like you know we don't we won't have that anymore it kind of sucks if there's any chance of that still happening it'll probably come on August 24th which is opening night for Gamescom which is another Jeff Keighley production mm -hmm. uh he has said that uh Gamescom opening night live which is what it's called is going to be the finale of the Summer Games Fest yeah, I guarantee you that some announcements from some of the publishers that like have their weeks will still like withhold some information until that evening. Right. I mean, this is this is video game trailers that everybody has one last thing. Yep. And this is going to be an entire night filled of one last things on August 24th. Right. Keely knows what he's doing, man. 
He's uh he's mega mind. He pretty much is the yeah. big brain. He but is. uh you you brought this up earlier that Nintendo usually does their own thing, but this year uh that that thing won't be happening in June. So they normally had their big Nintendo Direct that would happen in June, usually conveniently during the same week as E3. Uh that's not happening this year. Um it's being delayed to end of summer because of uh the pandemic. And there's an interesting point here from an article from Venture Beat that says this is probably because Japan more so than a lot of other countries is really not coping well with everybody having to work from home. I'm going to quote from directly uh, the article. The issue is that while many people outside of Japan view the country as on the cutting edge of technology, this isn't the case with all aspects of its business culture. In a story in the Washington Post, reporter Simone Denier, probably, explains that many IT departments and corporate strategies haven't changed in Japan since the 1990s. Companies still regularly use fax to send documents, and they have little awareness of cloud computing or video conferencing tools. Oh my god. So it's not a great environment for uh, work from home. I will say yeah. it seems like Nintendo is at least adapting a little bit well. They, I've read a couple of interviews with Sakurai specifically talking about how he's working on... Because he does a weekly column in Famitsu. Yeah. Just like talking about developing... Uh, and he's talked about how they're adapting, and it seems like they're doing okay, but it does seem like it's been something that they've needed to adapt to rather than, like, I know personally, and you're probably the same, like, it's something that I'm quite used to. Yeah. I think it's just funny to me, just like, just think of, like, if this, you know, I don't think Nintendo's, like, this far behind, but, like, just imagining, like, at Nintendo headquarters, like, they film, like, a, like, when Reggie was still there. Like, they filmed, like, a section of Reggie introducing a game, mm. and then they would, like, take the SD card out of the camera. I'm assuming that they've at least upgraded from beta tape, you know. You would hope. <laughs> to SD card camcorders. You know, someone grabs the SD card, like, runs it up to, like, an editor, and, like, the editor, like, fixes it, and then, like, puts it on, like, a like a 3.5-inch floppy disk, and then, like, has to run that over to the next guy. <laughs> And then, you know, the next guy does something on it and then, like, puts it onto another, you know, a CD or DVD right. that sort of, like, run it over to the next guy. Like, that's, I just think that's hilarious to think about in this day and age. Yeah, just like um, Nintendo records their directs with, like, a Rube Goldberg machine. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, yeah, I mean, I'm not too surprised that the, I guess I am at the same time. Um, it's just this, it's a weird, like, this infatuation that people have with Japanese culture and how much, you know, technology has come out of that country but at the same time like you look at the modern lay of the land now and how there's a lot more other countries that have far more advanced technological like standards mm -hmm. across the board you know south korea included uh and they've just like they've jumped ahead now um so yeah i mean uh, yeah i don't know what to think i i wanted a direct um it's it would you know what I was when I was reading this and when we we're when I was reading through the rundown when you put it in what the thing I thought to myself was like how Nintendo would it be if they said yeah yeah we don't have a di direct for June and then they drop one like the last week of May <laughs> they're just like yeah we didn't tell we we told you guys it wasn't in June we didn't we didn't tell you guys there wouldn't be one in May right <laughs> it just like happened to just drop one like it that'd be so Nintendo to do to do that um. I highly doubt it. I mean, if they're having trouble putting it together for June, like they're not going to have it ready for May. But yeah. I just thought it was hilarious. Just my mind just drifted into that, and I just thought it would be hilarious and what a Nintendo thing to do and say. So It's also extremely Nintendo to not understand the internet. So here we are. Yep. Yep. And that's not going to change for a while now. So, oh, well. Fix Ultimate Online. Hashtag. Anyway, this is all exciting, and we're going to get a lot of uh, game announcements throughout the summer. But... We have some this week we can already talk about. Oof, what a pivot. Round two, baby. Bay. Round two. Round two. Game announcements and updates. Holy crap, we got a lot. It's a big week. Yeah. I know the last one on here is something that you and I are both super interested in. Yeah. Or the last two. The last two on here. So let's run through the first ones quickly. I mean, they announced a Lord of the Rings Golem game like out of the blue today. Um, we had heard on... about it before, but this is like the first sort of confirmation that this is like a real thing. Yep. Yep. 
Uh, so yeah, this is from IGN. The first screenshots of Lord of the Rings Golem, the upcoming stealth adventure game from Daedalic, has emerged. Scheduled for release on PS5, Xbox Series X, and PC in 2021. We were told that this Golem wouldn't be based on Peter Jackson's imagining of the character. However, the screenshots which have popped up on GameStar show that he doesn't look that different. I feel like that's that depiction of the character is just so ingrained in people's minds that you almost have to make him look like that at this point. Yeah. This, I mean, to be totally fair, it kind of looks like one of those old Xbox platformer games, you know? Sure, like a, sure, sure. It has that fable. It has a little bit of that fable look to it too. Um, the way they've done like the whimsical the and fantastical, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and like just how the color shading is for some of the art. Um, what's it? Some of the screenshots and the animals and things like that. So, I think this is a game that's. It's weird because they could go a different a lot of different ways for this game. Like I'm looking at one of the screenshots and it's like has like four different options you could choose. Yeah, from it seems like, like you have to sort of battle with his sort of split personality. Right. It says like you have, you can click like calm down. And there's different sh- colors associated like, with it, mm-hmm. which is a very like Mass Effect. Yeah, it feels like that. It also feels like um, what's it, uh, Senua. Um, sure. Also, a lot of those like very, very uh, mentally thought-provoking type games uh, where you have to choose decisions, and you know, Detroit uh, becoming become human, or um, what are some of those other games like that? Uh, Beyond Two Souls. Mm-hmm. A lot of those like decision-making type games with like some like regular game elements to it. So yeah, so like it seems like you'll sort of have to make choices that depend on which. Gollum or Smeagol gets the dominant hold of the actual flesh of the character, you know what I mean? Yep. Uh, It seems like there's a lot of stealth involved, which would make sense. This is sort of, so the game is taking place post-Hobbit, but pre-Lord of the Rings. So in uh, the timeline, basically this is when Gollum has lost the ring. Yep. Knows that Bilbo took it. Knows where Bilbo lives because Bilbo had to tell him that in order to save his life, basically. Yep. Uh, and he is looking for Bilbo. So he's sort of traversing around, trying to find information on where to go, where the Shire is located. Uh, at some point during this, he also travels into Mordor. So it, we're probably going to go there at some point during the game. There's a screenshot of him in like an orc mine, it looks like. So, there's a lot of material to work with. I'm interested for sure. I don't know if I'm. That's... I don't know if I'm necessarily intrigued yet, but interested. Yeah, I mean, it's at least piqued my interest where I want to see like a trailer and a gameplay trailer and and see what it looks like when you're actually playing the game, um, and how integrated the decision making is into the game, or if it's like, you know, like quick time eventy, you know, where it comes to like a certain point in the game and it like forces you to make a decision. Um, right. whereas it's like fluid and it cut like these decision making moments come in and out, um, whether it be like small decisions or larger decisions. So, yeah, but I'm a, I'm a, yeah. I'm a huge Lord of the Rings fan. I'm actually rereading the series now. Uh, so I'm, I'm always going to be interested in something like this, but uh, um, Lord of the Rings games are great. You are a big fan of, uh, the next series. So why don't you uh. take us in? Uh, I mean, Star Wars. I mean, May the 4th be with you. Ah, today was Star Wars Day. So, of course, of course, Star Wars has announcements today, right? Like, why wouldn't they have announcements on... Gotta do it. Arguably, one of their biggest, like, known holidays. It's the day. Um, it's the it day. Is. It is. The first thing I... W- we haven't written on here, but the first thing I wanted to say is... I don't know if, by the time you're listening to this, which will be May the 5th, if the sale will still be going on... But they have a six. I think it's a seventy-seven dollar deal for twenty-six Star Wars games on Steam. That's insane. Uh, it goes through all of it, like Jedi, uh, like uh, uh, Jedi Outcast, the uh, Knights of the Old Republic game, oh my God, Republic Star Commando. Killer. Yeah, all of the nineties. Uh, Used him in Soul Calibur. Like, right, all of the late nineties, uh, like uh, Starfighter games uh, from the Star Wars series. They're all available. Like you can buy the entire set. Um, so yeah, if it's still there, go take a look. And if that, you can buy all the games separately too, and they're all on sale. I don't think a single one of the games is above nine dollars. So that's wild. It's great. Speaking uh, of Soul Caliber, 
Vader Immortal VR gets a release window. It is coming this summer. And it's also not just coming to regular VR machines, it's coming to the PlayStation 2. Not the PlayStation 2, the PlayStation Not the VR. PlayStation 2, but the PlayStation as well. <laughs> it's preview- That would uh, be according- insane. <laughs> coming to the PlayStation 2. You're going to have to pull those out. You're just going to have to pull those out of storage and just bust out your PlayStation 2s. It'll be on it'll be on like 14 DVDs. That would be incredible. Anyway. Yeah. IGN says, previously exclusive to Oculus devices like the Quest and Rift, Vader Immortal is a VR series set in the Star Wars galaxy that sees you descend into Darth Vader's fortress with the key to the galaxy's salvation or destruction. Announced as a part of the May the 4th celebrations, the PlayStation blog post detailing this announcement says, the game is coming this summer, but an exact date was not revealed. I do not have a PlayStation VR, nor do I have a VR system. But when this releases, I will most likely get one. You're that in. I mean, this game, like just the screenshot of like you like battling Vader with a lightsaber. You know what this reminds me of? Do you remember that old arcade game, uh, the Star Wars trilogy, where you played through the the initial three trilogies? It was like a sure, huge sure, sure. console setup with like the one joystick. And one of the in between missions be, uh, between like the episodes was a fight with Darth Vader, and you like had to use the joystick and like slash in like different like specific directions and like move the joystick or your lightsaber in like specific directions to like block his attacks too. Um, it kind of reminds me of that, but like it's a lot more free flowing. Mm-hmm. So I am super stoked. I wonder how they handle that because like you're obviously not going to kill him, right? I mean, you're going to die at the end. There's no question. There's no question you're going to die. Well, Fallen Order kind of handles that need. I don't know if we want to get into that. I feel like that's maybe a spoiler, but... Yeah. It's it been a while. Be. It has. But, I mean, just in case you haven't played it, we'll just we'll just let it be. Well, there's also some Fallen Order news, right? Right. And that's a great transition. I'm on um, fire, baby. You are. Fallen Order gets free DLC available today. Um, it's not su- substantial DLC, but it's like... There's an update to the battle grid for customizable challenges. Um, there's also a bunch of unlockables uh, and new like armor looks or lightsaber colors um, and just like aesthetic stuff. So yeah, sure. super, super, super cool. I and never played that the, game, but I, I heard a lot of good things about it. I'm surprised you have it because it's very Dark Souls-y, like how it plays. I mean, I, it, it, I still had Sekiro. That's true. Maybe it, maybe it's time to jump into this. It could be. It's that time. And then the last thing is uh, Lego Star Wars teases um, with a huge poster of its epic Star Wars saga video game. So I don't know if you know this, Jack. You know, the Lego Star Wars games, they've had uh, old ones panning from, I'd say, I'd say like eight, ten years ago um, or even more, even before that. Um, and it runs you through... Just like the movie, you play play it through. The last one they had was actually after episode seven. Um, and they had that one, and they haven't released one. Everyone thought they might, might make one for eight and nine, but they never did. So, But they're making this huge thing where it's like all, all of the old ones are remastered, and it's just one big game where you can play through the entire three trilogy series. Um, but the poster's super cool because... There, it it goes through the first three. Uh, the background is like the first three mm-hmm. episodes, and you see in one where it's like Obi Wan Yoda battling droids with the clone army, and it's like there's a massive amount of droids and clone troopers behind you. So this might actually be the first time where it's like open battleground type feeling, like tons of enemies. Mm-hmm. Um, the same with like they have a little screenshot of like Hoth. And like a bunch of like uh, stormtroopers coming over the edge and you're like in a trench, you know, shooting at them. So, yeah, I'm super stoked for this. It's super fun to play. Um, the writing in it is always good. The jokes are like super like whimsical and, and fun yeah. to play around. There's People a lot of are probably like they hear this and like, oh, whatever. Like, it's who cares? It's a Lego game. Like, don't yeah. sleep on the Lego games. They're they're legitimately fun and humorous, like you were saying, like they're good games. Yeah, there's a lot of jokes in these games, too, that aren't made for kids. Like, kids are definitely just going to, it'll just go over their head. But, like, if you're an adult playing this game, it's like, oh, wow, that's a that's actually a really good joke. Right. Um, so, yeah, it's super cool, um, super fun. 
it's a great couch co-op game if you have like a significant other or a friend you want to play with too super easy to to jump in and jump out just like the lego um what's it marvel games mm -hmm. super fun to play but yeah that's pretty much it uh from the star wars and then we have another game i'm gonna flip it to you for the next one here's here's the transition uh Star Wars Battlefield has been one of EA's biggest uh, focuses, but they're sunsetting that. The servers are still up. You'll still be able to play it. And moving on to regular Battlefield, which they announced this week will be coming in 2021. Uh, I'm quoting an article from GameSpot now that says, EA hasn't shared any concrete details about the new Battlefield game, but it did tease that the title will be targeting... New innovation that will be enabled by next-gen platforms. Uh, later in the article, it also said that it's releasing the new Battlefield game in 2021 instead of 2020 when the new consoles release to take advantage of their larger install base. Uh, this is quoting EA Management. Bringing out Battlefield in 2020 where the new console base is fairly small doesn't really give justice to the potential of the title. And so that's part of our driver in moving the title to fiscal 2022, which is 20 the year 2021 how much of do you think this was changed because of the fact that COVID 19 hit and all those things started coming out about how they might not make production um, like avenues meet to be able to provide enough devices honestly i don't think that was a factor in this oh really i think they were always targeting this window i and it's it's sort of we talked about this before when we talked about what's going to be a launch title and why I don't think Horizon 2 is a launch title. It's because install bases when new consoles come out are small. Yeah. They want to wait until more people have the console. And it makes sense. Because they, they're not saying it. They're not saying that this is a next-gen exclusive. And I actually, I don't know if it will be. I, I, I go back and forth. But if this is one that they're, like they're saying, targeting new innovation enabled by next-gen platforms, that's their big thing. I mean, wait until the install base is there. It just makes sense. Yeah, I'm also curious what that means. Like, targeting new innovation that will be enabled by next-gen platforms. Like, like, what does that actually... What does that, like, you know, as a gamer, like a consumer gamer perspective, like, what does that mean? Does that mean... Does that mean, like, instead of 64 people on the battleground, like, I, I mean, they get, like, a like 180? Like, that's, like, the norm now. Like, it'll actually feel like you know you're in like a, a massive massive map with tons of people who knows um, maybe we'll find out later this week maybe we will we can get to that later but uh first i need to get hype i need you to get hype because several new trailers and some new information about xenoblade chronicles definitive edition dropped this week they were Japanese trailers, correct? They later released English versions. Okay, yeah. See, I haven't seen those because I saw that they released the Japanese ones, and I and I just like I was like, oh, okay, like these are great. Uh, Honestly, the trailers don't really contain that me that much new information. They contain new visuals, and let me tell you, they are great. Oh, uh, the game just looks so much more prettier. It is gonna be such a banger, my dude. I, I, I could not be more hyped. Like, this is, like I've said multiple times, one of my favorite JRPGs of all time, if not my favorite of all time. It's so good. The writing is incredible. The characters are so endearing and so well fleshed out, and the environments are so creative and unique. Like, the whole universe that this is set in is so deep and cool. It's just, I, I can't wait. I can't wait for people to get into this because I actually think, and I may be at the point where I'm willing to make this actual prediction that I think this is going to, this is going to be the game that makes Xenoblade, Xenogears, the Xeno series break big finally. Oof. Maybe. You might be right. I mean, a lot of these like remaster HD games have been like, you know, the Kickstarter for a lot of these games coming onto the Switch, right? I think it's a. I think it's a couple things. I think this has hype from Shulk being in Smash. Mm -hmm. uh, it has hype built up from Xenoblade Two doing well. It did better than I think any previous Xenoblade game. Yeah. Uh, and it's hitting at the right time. People are ready 
for a meaty game like this. Yeah, I mean, you could invest like a good 120 hours into this game. Dude, I because the first you... time I played this game, 120 hours, I was probably three-fourths of the way through the game. <laughs> this game has a lot to, like, a lot it's of these monolith soft games. a lot. There's a lot to do. I'm I'm honestly hoping that this is the game that might get some of our friends to start playing, like, monolith soft games. Like, maybe get into Xenoblade Chronicles 2, because I think you and I are the only ones out of our group of friends that actually played yeah, Chronicles 2. Yeah, I think 2, you're right. So... I hope this is the one that gets people because I think the characters in this definitely are. You get more attached. These are the, the these are the Chronicles best. Too. Like yeah. I loved Xenoblade Two, loved it. Yeah, I have issues. I have a lot of issues with it, but I loved that game and I loved its characters. The characters are the best part of that game, and Xenoblade One's characters are better. Yeah, they blow them out of the water. Like it's it's not even close. It's super. It's yeah. This game's super fun. But run me through the changes. And what you saw from those trailers. So I know this you have this is what I'm actually really hyped about because the trailers the trailers provide a a brief hype, but these are the details that really get me excited because the first Xenoblade is really really good, but there are a lot of uh, things that create barriers to entry, and yep. so far it seems like a lot of these are being taken down. I'm going to run you down this list. The quest screen has been revamped. Information is prevented presented in a clearer way, which is huge because. In the original, it was bad. Uh, if you set a quest as an active quest, you'll be guided to your destination. People need that. They're used to that in games now. Uh, if you enlarge the map to get a better look where you need to go, <laughs> in the in the previous game, uh, the map, there's no zoom. Yep. That sucks. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this is some specific things, but like Colony 6 is an area in the game. It has a reconstruction quest that's been made more convenient because that was a slog. Think of it as like this is an example a lot of people get. The, in the original game, it was real tedious, sort of like how tedious the section of Wind Waker is when you need to find all the Triforce pieces. Yep. That was made a lot better in this in their HD remake. I hope this one follows the suit. Uh, you can check how much money, what kind of materials you need for construction, right from the menu screen. Affinity charts, menu screens are way easier to read. Seeing details about various people you've met during your journey is easier. Uh, all of their details, which were usually scattered across like items and different menus, are now all in one place in a profile. It's a, it's awesome. You also now get fashion gear because something that this game has that Xenoblade 2 didn't have, you could wear different armor in Xenoblade 2, but it wouldn't change your appearance. In this one, if you change your armor, you change your clothes. But some of them are real ugly. <laughs> so this gives you fashion gear that is basically transmog. Yeah. Uh, you keep the stats of the main equipment you're wearing even while you're wearing your fashion gear, which is awesome. But all of that is great. That's all amazing quality of life things. But what's really hype, the real meat of the hype, is that they're adding on a future-connected epilogue to this game which is supposed to take place post end of Xenoblade Chronicles and sort of bridge the gap between one and two. Yep. They've said that it seems very substantial. Uh, this is from stealth 40 K. Who's a very well connected Nintendo, not leaker, but newsbreaker. Uh, he wouldn't be surprised if it's 20, 25 plus hours, which if you've played Xenoblade two, is sort of reminiscent of the Torna expansion, which was huge and yep. incredible. It takes place on a whole new environment that was never playable in the original game, which it sort of became a meme that it existed but didn't. <laughs> I'm I could not be more excited. It's a lot of stuff. I mean, what we're recording this on May fourth. The game comes out May 29th, I believe. Mm hmm. Twenty five. Twenty sixth. Twenty sixth. Let me check. It's somewhere right around there. So, 29th, I mean, you were right. Yep, only a uh, little over three weeks. I can't wait. I need it. We're almost there. We're almost there. But, on the opposite side of that, another game was announced. Big game. Uh, big game. Was announced that's not that close. <laughs> if anything, not at all. Is, if anything, this is the farthest thing because we have no idea when it's coming out. Um, actually, we kind of do, but Assassin's Creed Valhalla, what a name, was announced uh, via 
like a live stream and then like a you know cinematic trailer. Mm -hmm. Let me just run you through some of this. Uh, the game will be available both on current and next gen. Um, for me, it feels like what they're doing is the same thing they did with uh, Assassin's Creed Black Flag, mm -hmm. where you know they released on both. There's Xbox branding on the ads for Valhalla, and I'll, I'm going to swing back to this later. Um, the game takes place in Scandinavia. Um, it kind of looks like you can travel to England, which I wouldn't be surprised if you could, because you take on like Knights Templar and like a lot of those English looking castles. So I'm assuming that's the case. I haven't read too deeply into it. I'm and then, of course, Assassin's Creed now, like, always has boats. Like, what, there's no Assassin's Creed that doesn't have boats. Because because Marine Warfare in the Assassin's Creed games have, like, become, like, a big part of it since mm -hmm. um, the Assassin's Creed, was that 4? Where it takes place in the in the U.S., like, the Revolutionary War? Um, I think that was 3. Was that 3? Yeah, you might be right. That actually might be 3. So, yeah, that, since that, like, you know, boat and boats and, like, all that, it's so much fun. Um, and, yeah, they're definitely not going to get rid of that. Um, educated guess for me is that it takes Assassin's Creed Odyssey and like the map of that with like these I the small islands, mm -hmm. like a big continent, lots of bodies of water, and you just expand that and like mold it into Scandinavia and England. Um, it looks yeah, real pretty. The screenshots from the Xbox One X look gorgeous. Like some of these screenshots don't look like screenshots. They look like, like cinematic, like trailer shots, mm -hmm. but they said that it's all uh, gameplay. Um, and then social social stealth returns, which is huge. This hasn't been the case for quite some time. Um, and what that is, is if you played the original Assassin's Creed or like Assassin's Creed 2, it's like mm -hmm. if you see a big group of people, like you can just kind of just like walk in it and then it like fades your character into like a slight gray to show that you're yep. hidden in the crowd. You weren't able to do that for quite some time, but they're bringing. I remember it in back. the first one, it was like you could be like a, a monk chanting monk as like they walked through a crowd or something. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. You could like sit on a bench with like a bunch with like a couple other people and just kind of sit there as like guys walk by you and they wouldn't know. Mm -hmm. um, also, the return of the hidden blade. You the the hidden blade comes back after you know in Odyssey you you for you fought with uh, like the edge of the spear of Leonidas, so you didn't really play with the hidden blade. That was your hidden blade. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. And then, I mean, you have a thing about smart delivery and the Xbox So, yeah, this is, this is something that they announced as a, a Microsoft thing. Smart delivery is what they're calling the free upgrade program for Xbox Series X. And this is coming from an article from The Verge. It automatically upgrades owners who own the Xbox One version of the game to Xbox Series X version for free. It also works the other way. If you buy the Xbox Series X version, you get the Xbox One version. Effectively, it means that players will only ever need to buy a smart delivery game once instead of buying separate copies to be able to play on both consoles. That is awesome. It is dope. Cyberpunk is another game that will also support this. Uh, no word from Sony on whether it'll be similar yet. Yep. Uh, I'm assuming if Xbox is doing it, it probably means that they'll be doing it as well. We just don't have an official name for their system yet. Yeah, so the thing here, the big thing here for me is, yeah, the gameplay, the game stuff looks great, but they're marketing it with Xbox Series 1 uh, or Series X, which means that I think this could be one of those games that launches with the Xbox Series X. Yeah. Like, you know, just one of those, like, either packaged in the game, like, box or... Like, this is one of the big ones that they're pushing and will be pushing every time they, like, do an announcement. Yeah. If they don't already have a first-party game lined up to be a part of the launch titles, um, I think this is the big one that they're probably going to push. So, yeah, it's Would interesting. Would not surprise me. It's interesting that they decided to pair with um, Xbox, which, if I'm not mistaken, this is actually the first game that's branded um, to one of the next-gen consoles. Well, Sony teased that I forget what it's called the the game where you like fight monsters or whatever gods something like that. Gods and monsters? No, no, no. This is like a different thing. I, I forget what it. It's like a new IP. Got it. I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I forget what it was, but yeah. we, we we they showed like a cinematic, and that's all we saw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I believe was that a first party game? I think so. 
yeah, I think this is the first third party game, right? Or like outside first party game that's branded itself with one of like the names of the next gen consoles. You could you you're probably right. Yeah. So it's super interesting. Like this is this is probably the trigger now for at least the rest of the year of just games aligning themselves with companies and with the new um, stuff. Because remember, like when the PlayStation Four dropped, um, the big thing was that they took away. I think I think COD, right? They took COD away from yeah. uh, Microsoft, and that was like a huge thing. They also took Destiny, um, and like was was their big thing there. So yeah, yeah they, they took Bungie. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be pretty interesting, like to see which games align themselves with what consoles, at least leading up to the launch of the new um, generation. Well, speaking of the launch of the new generation, Whew. hot round, pivot round three. Let's get it. Round three. Xbox Series X is having a gameplay reveal this week, May seventh, this coming Thursday. We know that we're seeing Valhalla gameplay. They've already said that. We don't know anything else. So I ask you, Rob, what do you think we see? Oh, I mean, that's tough. I mean, here's the thing. We don't know anything. So, like, just hit hit me with, like, what would make you hype. Oh, my goodness. Um, I mean, first of all, I think seeing some, like, non-gameplay stuff would be super cool. Like, seeing what, when you turn it on. Like, what does your home, home like, Ooh, screen look like? That's, I hadn't right? thought like, of that, but that is that is interesting. Right? Seeing like, some of, like, what's, just the what's quality the, of life What's stuff. The, the menu look like? Exactly. What's the menu look like? What does, like, your share screen look like? Like, is it easy to, to get yourself connected to, I mean, I'm sure they're going to be pushing Mixer, right? So... Is it easy to connect to Mixer? Like, how does that work? I wonder if they do do a lot of those general stuff because, honestly speaking, I don't think they're going to have a lot of games to push to show um, other than Valhalla. I don't so, know. This is branded as a gameplay reveal. I mean, yeah, okay, all right, I'll bite. Then, if we're if we're just going on the if we're just going off of that and we're just going to say gameplay. The one thing that would send me flying through the roof is Halo. Yeah. No that's question. That's regardless. Yeah. Without a doubt, that's the big one. Um, But my the likelihood of seeing that is very low. You don't think the other. Ready? I just don't think they are. But the other side of this that I would think would be huge would be the next Gears of War. Sure. That, because that, that would line up. Right, because one, the characters and the engine and everything they're using, they're not overhauling it because the next one is like the the final one in this like trilogy. The last one just came out, what, last year, end of last year? Last year, yeah. So this one's the trilogy, right? So like they're just wrapping up the trilogy. They have all the character models. I've I've read stories like they already know like how the story is going to go. Sure, so, I, I could buy that we see gameplay and they say this is coming like holiday 2021 or even 2022. If they want to show gameplay like. Yeah, or like summer 2021. Sure. Even. So, yeah, that's I mean, that's the two like pillars that is the big of, thing that we should touch on. Sorry to t- interrupt, but like, no, no, go ahead. One of the biggest things that we'll see that's going to be different with this new gen is that like there's the differences are much more minute between this gen that's coming and the current gen that we're in. Right. So these engines that these games run on don't really have to go through huge updates. Yeah. It's more about like optimizing current engines. Right. And, or even optimizing the next gen engines, which might not come until like the second round of like, right. You know, generational video games for that, you know, like until I mean, it's Halo 5 infinite, which is which is technically what Halo Five, Halo Six, so like beyond like Halo Seven is probably like where we're gonna get like where they fully flesh out and use the Xbox Series X to like its full potential, right? Same with the PlayStation Five. It's like the next you know Horizon Zero Dawn Three might not do it. Maybe the next Spider Man or God of War game does. So um, let me let me hit you with a prediction. Hit me. Speaking of games using current engines that I think would make you hype. I think it's entirely possible and maybe even probable that we see some gameplay gameplay from the next Final Fantasy installment. 
Final Ooh. Fantasy Seven. Oh, part two already on the Xbox One X? Would not surprise me. They said they want it soon. Oh, wow. Yeah. I. The only thing is... The only thing is, one, it's not out on the Xbox X yet. Or it's not even That's out on I'm the saying. Xbox like, One. That could be like their, one of their huge announcements. One of, you said, that like, are they stealing somebody? Maybe. But, mm. you know, then again, now that I say that, it's, it might be hard to steal something that's possibly still under contract with Sony. Yeah. I, I, will, I will go off of, off of what you just said and say, you know what I, oh, you know what, this is actually more probable. You know what I, you know what I think we see? Hit me. We see Square Enix's Marvel Avengers. Yeah, that would make sense. It makes perfect sense here um, with the game coming out. I'm sure that game's going to have this push up. They they probably can't take Final Fantasy because one it's still under like that timed release under Sony, so they can't take that. But do they if they want to take a game that's going to bring in the hype and aesthetically looks next gen? It with no doubt no doubt in my mind it has to be uh, Avengers. I think another safe bet is seeing some Cyberpunk. I mean they already have that yeah uh, Cyberpunk branded Xbox One. Oh, it's so nice. I seriously considered buying it. It's dope. It is it's real. so nice Real looking. dope. So, yeah, seeing some cyberpunk gameplay on the Series X would surprise me very little. What about, I'm just thinking first party games, you know, because, you know, we get, we're getting Valhalla, which is not really a third party game. So I'm thinking first party games and we already ran through Halo. We already ran through that. What if we get a new racing game here yeah i think that's another safe bet yeah right which one is um, i always forget which one is there's forza or is there's there's this forza yeah so yeah seeing some new forza gameplay which it's funny because i, I forget about it but like th- those games sell bonkers they they do so mm-hmm. well and they're absolutely beautiful they're incredible yeah aesthetically like it's just they're so fun to like just I played I played the one where you can like literally drive across the United States. Mm-hmm. I think it takes about, you know, 20 minutes to drive across the country. And I did it in a Ford Mustang. Like and I put it on my 4K TV on my Xbox One S and it looked beautiful. Yeah. So yeah, so I, I think that's I think that's real safe. Yeah. Real safe bet. And then I got two more for you. Hit me. First one is Ori. Yeah. Right? That be that would make sense. Uh, uh, is so is I didn't play the second one yet. Is there? Did they leave it to where there could be a third? Yeah, I mean, any of these games you could always continue, right? Like sure. it, le- it ends on a happy note, but like you could always you'd always turn the tide. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Um, and my last one here, Cuphead. Mm. The only thing that makes me hesitant about that is that that art style takes them so long yeah i don't know if it's ready i don't think so either i'm just running through all of the first party games that have been sure. hits for xbox over the last few years that they could that's like maybe ready to show like their second installment of mm-hmm. you know i would have said sunset overdrive but then you know what happened with that you know uh developing company is they're now under sony that's right. so that's right they can't really do Sunset Overdrive 2 unless they brought in another developer to do it. I mean, like, yeah, they have the IP. Yeah, I mean, but that's that was a great game that they It never, was, but I don't know if it sold well enough to justify yeah. the sequel, which sucks. What about the Dead Rising series? I mean, another Dead Rising game? Yeah. Under Capcom? Arcade, beat em up. I think Dead Rising 4 was a launch title with the Xbox One, if I'm not mistaken. I, I think it was available on day one, so... That's another one there. Um, but I'm, I mean, you know, this is the qualm we've had with Xbox is that we just haven't had enough first party games from them to like warrant, like, ooh, could they be talking about this? Could they be talking about this? Like, the, the leader in that group is Nintendo because they have so many good first party games. But then, you know, right behind them is Sony with some of their big hitters over the last few years and some like hits that, you know, no one thought would even be hits like Horizon Zero Dawn. Yeah. And then. Microsoft is just like falling off a map because so that well, actually have... that actually leads into one of my predictions, which is that Microsoft has made a lot of plays and they've brought in a lot of new studios mm. as first party studios. Right. I think we see a new first party IP. Ooh. 
you have any predictions on these? I have no goals? idea. I mean, this I think it's brand new, out of nowhere. Okay. I have. A, I guess I have another. I have another prediction based off of that, which would be Senua Two, because they've already announced that that's coming, right? And they just yep. bought that. They bought that developing company. Yeah, we. Yeah, but I, that would make sense. Totally. Yeah. So that's another one that would make sense there, because uh, that's one of those also like super beautiful like aesthetic games that they could easily be like mm-hmm. look at this in look at this in 4k ray tracing i don't know if ray tracing is actually possible on the xbox one x or series x but you know that's a pc term that's like super now and hot so but yeah that's that's my big prediction i'm gonna stick my flag in is a new first party ip what about minecraft 2 bro <laughs> it's possible right isn't that you don't think that's possible? I think it's possible. I think if they ever make a Minecraft two and leave current Minecraft behind, they're stupid. <laughs> I actually saw a video today um, showing Minecraft, like just normal Minecraft, and then a Minecraft running on a PC with ray tracing on. Mm-hmm. It looks so. It looks gorgeous. Oh yeah. Oh the, my you, goodness. The stuff you can mod in a Minecraft to make it look. I mean, it's awesome. Yeah. But that's what I'm saying. Like, Minecraft is is perfect the way it is and if they if people have like servers that have been built up for like years and years and years and years and years if they drop that they'd be so dumb yeah i yeah they definitely yeah you're right you're right i think the last thing for me is i think you have to bring in a sports game sure i think you know you, you might put forts on there but that that's like a I don't want to say that's a super niche market, but it's definitely a more of a niche market than like let's say it's like an NBA it's a very 2K successful or, niche. Mm-hmm. But it's not like an NBA two K or like a FIFA twenty, so or like a FIFA game. So they love they love to bring out like a soccer player to talk about FIFA. So I would not mm-hmm. be surprised if we saw some FIFA. Yeah, and FIFA on the next gen to see like what the player models look like and all that. Super cool. Yeah, another game that just sells outrageous. Mm-hmm. And I buy every year, even though it doesn't really change every year, every year. Yeah, stupid of me. Um, but yeah, I mean, do you have any other other predictions? <coughs> I've been sitting here trying to think of other third parties, but the the most I can come up with is that I would not put it past them to like do show some kind of Fortnite thing because they're partnered with Ninja with Mixer, like not even like a new Fortnite thing, just like look at how quick stuff loads or like look at all this integration we have with mixer like you were saying like that would not surprise me yeah i mean let me just i just pulled up an article here so microsoft xbox game studios they acquired several game studios in 2018 including obsidian entertainment and in exile entertainment in november and then per playground games undead labs Ninja Theory and Compulsion Games in June. The ones that jump out at me are Obsidian and Ninja Theory. Right. So the last thing Obsidian released was... One of the outers, right? Right, yeah. Which could make sense that they're gearing up for the next one. Totally. Like Playground, Playground Games... uh, or let me just read you what it says here. This article is from a ways away, but Xbox Game Studios is working on several upcoming titles, including Halo Infinite by 343 Industries, possibly another title for the Fable franchise by Playground Games, the much-delayed Crackdown 3, and the much-anticipated Gears 5, as well as Ori and the Will of the Wisps. So three of those games are already out, Crackdown 3, Gears 5, and Will of the Wisps. But yeah, Playground Games may be coming out with another Fable game. That's Do you think they're still going to try to milk that Fable cow? They could. Is it, I mean, is it not all dried up after what was what was the name of that? Was it Fable like Overlord or something that they wanted like, to do le- that was like a co op thing? Yeah, with like three characters. It was like Fable Legends or, or something. It was something. Yeah, along something those lines. like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, and then that that got canceled. So, yeah, I mean, maybe that's there. I mean, rare too, right? Sea of Thieves. Like it's Sea of Thieves has actually like grown pretty significantly. Yeah, Loki has become like a banger. Mm-hmm. So maybe. Maybe like we see Sea of Thieves on the next gen, or like a little preview into Sea of Thieves two. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot there. I mean, look at this: Xbox has three, four, three industries, the Coalition, Compulsion Games, the Initiative, In Exile, Mojang, 
Ninja Theory, Obsidian, Playground Games, Rare, Turn 10 Studios, Undead Labs, and its group publishing group, global publishing group. There's a lot of ammo. That's a lot. That's a lot. And we've only talked about, I think, three or four of those. So who knows what what else they're working on? Well, I, I can't wait until Thursday to see how much we got wrong. Yeah. And I think everyone can watch it live on YouTube or Mixer. It'll or be on, on everything, I assume. I mean, I'm. You think it'd be on Twitch too? Yeah, I think they have to be. That's super. That's a super weird, like marketing dichotomy there. Just because you have your own streaming service and yet you have to stream on another person's platform because right. it just gets you more exposure. Right. It's super weird. Who knows? But uh, I think that's. I think that's going to do it for us. We made it. We're through all three rounds, baby. Big week. We did it. I mean, we'll be back next week with after the Xbox stuff, right? And who knows? It'll either be a triumphant return or uh, we'll we'll be back to eat some crow. <laughs> Watch them not announce like any games. It's just like gameplay. It's all gameplay Valhalla. from games. Yeah. Or like gameplay from games that have like already been released, just like up on right. the next gen console. Right. <laughs> Can't wait. So sad. Well, uh, let them know where to find you so they can, they can at you. Uh, Thursday once we get all this wrong you'll find a, find me on Twitter at Rob11HWANG and I am at Jack Peglo we are also at Friendly's Pod our DMs are always open so slide on in you can also email us at friendlyspodcast at gmail.com as well we are on iTunes we're on Spotify we're on Google Play we're on iHeartRadio we're everywhere you could ever want to listen to us. Uh, and if you have the chance to leave us a review, we uh, we would greatly appreciate it. We read all that, take all that feedback in. And, you know, if you just if you want to call us handsome, I wouldn't be mad. <laughs> yeah. I mean, are any of our – no, my face is on the internet. Is your face anywhere on Twitter? Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Then you'll, you'll find us. You can, you can be a judge for yourself. But uh, until then, this is this is Jack signing off. Peace out. Deuces. It's also, I feel like it's a running joke on like every podcast that I listen to that whenever someone says like, we'll edit this in post or we'll cut this in post, it never <laughs> you never happens. do. You never do. Like it's Unless like an it's... unwritten rule of podcasting. Yeah. Unless it's like super blatant. Like someone just like, you know, cussed out someone for like a few minutes. <laughs> right. Like... Or like you misspoke someone's name and accidentally called them like a slur. Yeah. 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 yeah Bad that's news. Stuff. That stuff you need out of there, but otherwise it's in. Yep. That's the best stuff. It's best of content.